Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Greenham, the Director of Economy, Enterprise and Manufacturing here at the RSA. And it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, special lunchtime talk. We're here today to mark 10 years uh, exactly to the date that we saw queues forming outside one of our major financial institutions, the Northern Rock Bank. And that has heralded the start of a financial crisis uh, and a far-reaching economic and arguably political crises that have followed. Working with a global network of partner organizations, we're hosting a number of events here at our RSA House and elsewhere around the city and in fact internationally uh, during this week to reflect a decade on from the crisis on three questions. What lessons have we learned from the crash? Have we taken the necessary steps to reform our economic system? And can we develop a wider understanding of what's needed to deliver a fairer, more resilient and sustainable economy? So as part of that activity, many groups uh, have been joining in by live stream. Uh, today's event is being live streamed. Uh, and so I know that there are groups actually around the country. I think we've got a group in Bristol watching. We've got a group in a city law firm watching. So welcome to all of you uh, online. And uh, both you here, please uh, don't switch your phones off because we would like you to tweet uh, frantically during the course of the lecture. But do switch them to silent, please. And use the hashtag, which hopefully is up there. Oh, it isn't actually. But use the hashtag 10 years after. Uh, great. So without uh, further ado, um, let me introduce, uh, he needs no introduction of course, but I shall introduce him anyway. Uh, today's guest, Robert Peston, who was BBC business editor at the time uh, of the crisis. And he broke the story, of course, as you all know, of Northern Rock's emergency funding appeal to the Bank of England. He then covered at close hand the ensuing run on the bank, the negotiations around its rescue and the global financial crash that followed. Uh, and in his reporting and writing in the years since, Robert has continued to be one of the most astute analysts of the role of the key actors in the crisis, from politicians to bankers to regulators, as well as its further reaching uh, economic and political impact. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Robert Peston. So Robert, actually, um, you you started uh, your career in journalism very early on. You became a banking uh, correspondent mm. and an editor. So you are a banking specialist. So uh, would you mind starting, perhaps, before we get to the events of the 14th and the 13th and 14th, just explain to us quickly what went wrong with Northern Rock? What was the underlying problem with that bank? Um, so I first started taking an interest in Northern Rock in 2003 when I was city editor of the Sunday Telegraph. Um, and what I noticed was that this was a mortgage bank that was growing at something like twice the rate of its competitors. Um, now, very, very, very occasionally in the history of capitalism, when a business performs significantly better in a very bog standard traditional industry, performs considerably better than its competitors, sometimes it's because it has made some incredible technological leap. Um, but Mostly in the history of capitalism, when a business performs like that, it's because they are taking dangerous risks, um, which they are rather good at hiding for quite a long time. So I just made a comment in 2003 in a column saying I was a bit anxious about this bank. It was growing a bit too fast. Uh, and I think I used the expression when a, you know, a business looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Um, now, for years, uh, you know, I looked like a blithering idiot because uh, Northern Rock continued to grow faster than other mortgage banks, um, and its share price went up and up and up. Um, uh, until August the 9th, 2007, which is the date that I and many other people use as the start 
of the financial crisis. Um, the queues at Northern Rock for most people in the UK and actually around the world is in a sense that sort of symbolic visual moment for the start of the crisis. But actually August the 9th is more important. The reason August the 9th is important is because that was the moment that asset-backed bond markets simply shut down. Uh, it was impossible for banks and financial institutions to parcel up mortgages and sell them to other investors in the shape of bonds. And the reason that was a cataclysmic moment for the rich West is because banks had become so dependent uh, on these markets to raise money. Um, uh, they were, you know, in this country, not much of Europe, particularly in America though, uh, you know, a f an incredibly important source of finance was parceling out mortgages, selling to investors in the, in, in, in the shape of bonds. Now, those markets closed down because belatedly, and I say belatedly, and I think many of you will know this story, but, but you know, and, and it's been told rather brilliantly in a film called The Big Short and a book called The Big Short, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, but, you know, belatedly, Wall Street worked out that many of these mortgages were, to use a technical term, pure shit. Um, you know, they were loans that were never going to be repaid. And that therefore, unfortunately, you know, the, if the mortgages were pure shit, so were the bonds. Um, and the problem was that it was impossible to actually know which bonds were safe and which bonds were worthless. And therefore, you had this extraordinary thing, and it really was extraordinary, um, which was investors just decided because they couldn't tell the good from the bad, they weren't going to touch any of them. And so these markets shut down, and that deprived banks of a source of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds worth of funds. Now, because I'd identified Northern Rock as a risky bank many years earlier, I was acutely aware that one of the risks it was taking was it became far too dependent on these markets to raise the money that it needed to make loans. And um, there are two things that a sound bank has to do, but historically, m most people only focus on one of those things. Banks obviously have to lend in a sensible and cautious and prudent way, but they also have to borrow in a sensible, prudent and cautious way. Because a bank can go bust for two reasons. It can go bust because the people it's lent to, or the institutions it lends to, the, co the companies that it lends to, can't pay back and it makes excessive losses, or it can simply lose the confidence of creditors and not borrow. And if, if a bank can't borrow, it can't repay all of us what we have deposited with them, because, of course, the point that actually became acutely aware to people, but we would sort of forgotten until the crisis, is when we deposit money in a bank, they lend it out. It isn't sitting there. So... If a bank can't borrow more money and we ask for our money back, it's bust, right? So when markets close down in that way and a bank cannot borrow money, it is bust. So on August the 9th, markets closed down. And at that point, uh, I knew Northern Rock because it was more dependent than other British banks. All British banks were in some way using these markets. And other British banks were pretty dependent, but Northern Rock was the most extreme case of a big bank being dependent on these bond markets. And so I knew on August the 9th that it had a problem. I wrote a big column on August the 9th talking about why this was a cataclysmic moment for the world. It's one of the bits of journalism I'm sort of proud of because actually, curiously, it was not something that most journalists identified at the time. Um, and I also then a few days wrote, later wrote a little piece saying, and by the way, one of the institutions, I'm, I'm, you know, there was no secret about what I was doing. I said pu very publicly, I'm keeping an eye on Northern Rock because Northern Rock has a particular problem here. And, you know, I was aware that if those markets didn't reopen, um, Northern Rock would either collapse or it would be bailed out by the Bank of England as somebody who had taken 
you know, some would, 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 would say a sort of slightly, you know, wonkish uh, uh, interest in banks for many, many, many years. Um, I was persuaded the Bank of England would not let it collapse. And therefore, I just monitored uh, what was going on. I was an unusual journalist because, um, you know, in, a, in my career, I'd been a business journalist, a banking journalist, a political journalist. I'd done investigations. And unlike um, most journalists, I sort of knew people at both ends of town. I knew people in the city and in business, and I knew people in Westminster and politics, and obviously I knew the regulators. And so I was unusual in the sense that I had multiple sources for a story of this sort. It's sort of, um, a sort of, you know, uh, in a sense a lucky journalist that I had these sources, because these were the sources that were very relevant as the crisis um, unfolded. And I just rang these people in a rather monotonous, boring way, um, for you know a few weeks until it became clear to, people have often asked me who was your source the answer is actually there wasn't a single source once you know one of the things about the kind of journalism I do is you have to sort of immerse yourself in a story you get a sense of where things are moving and then you ring lots of people and you hope that they'll each give you a sort of scrap of information at the end of it you can put the puzzle together and you've got the answer at the beginning of the week of September the th so it was the night of September the 13th that I did the story which said Northern Rock had gone cap in hands the bank for a bailout. It was actually the beginning of the week that it was obvious to me that they were going to have to and was like, you know, the, the regulators were all preparing for this, the, the bankers were preparing for it, the politicians were half aware of it. Um, and, you know, um, on the uh, Thursday, it was the, it was the 13th, um, I was ready to, in a sense, publish, and publishing in this sentence meant going on BBC News at 8.30, which is what I did. Uh, and I said, you know, it's bankers uh, run out of money, um, it's gone cap in hand for the Bank of England. And w one of the slightly surreal things that I was subsequently told was the meeting was actually happening at the court of the Bank of England um, as I was putting out my broadcast, and one of these pink frock-coated footmen that they have at the Bank of England went into the meeting to tell the uh, court, it's called the court, it's such a grand institution, the Bank of England, the court of the Bank of England, that the BBC had just reported something which they were about to do. Um, um, anyway, well, actually, that's what happened. Well, thank you for that. And I actually, you brought it to exactly the point was I wanted to ask you about next, which is, was that evening on Thursday the 13th, yeah. when you appeared on our screens, and explained that Northern Rock had, had gone cap in hand to the Bank of England. Um, now, you, you made a point, I remember, of saying that you didn't think that depositors needed to be worried. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, now, you, you have subsequently been accused by, by all sorts of people, and I noticed Alex Brummer had a pop on Newsnight the other night yeah. as well on this, of actually causing the run. So I'm just interested as to whether you had a moment of, you know, as a journalist, did, did, you, did you have a sort of process of, Mm, you know, is there a public interest dilemma here between me doing my job as a journalist and me perhaps keeping quiet and letting the court of the bank and the, and the, and the authorities sort of sort it out? No, actually. I mean, so... Um, I mean, obviously, in any story that I do, you want to be a messenger, not an actor. Right? I don't, I've never done journalism to, as a propagandist or to shape events. I try and give information to people so that they can make up their own minds. Now, you know, I have to be honest, there are times in my life when I see people doing things so spectacularly stupid that it is very, very hard to be uh, impartial. Um, you know, I might have faced a few of those challenges in politics over the past year or so. Um, that would be for you to decide. Um, but I desperately try to be impartial, right? But this was, this was not a, a situation where it was about impartiality. This was a situation where I was aware that a very important financial institution was in difficulties. And the only circumstances in which I could have withheld that information would be actually if I departed from what I regarded as the role, the fundamental role of a journalist like me, which is to give people the information they need to make up their own minds about what to do in their own lives. And for me to withhold information that, in my view, was palpably in the public interest um, would have been 
actually, in my view, the end of my career as a journalist, um, because I would have been making a value judgment about that, that somehow, you know, I would have effectively saying everybody in this room um, was simply too ignorant to know what to do with this information. Um, and that would have been playing God rather than just being a sort of proper uh, journalist. So uh, all my effort that night was, in, was devoted towards presenting the information as clearly and as dispassionately and as unsensationally as I could. And the words that I used, I mean, you know, if I have a regret, I said, absolutely categorically, and I reviewed them at the time, I said, by the way, I didn't think there was a reason for depositors to fear that they would lose their money. Um, and I also said that um, I did not believe that the bank's loans, as they were currently constituted, were significantly bad, right? Um, and I actually said something else, which is that with the Bank of England stepping in, that was a sign of the authorities' confidence that they could keep this thing going, right? Anyway, um, you know, Alex Brammer makes, makes this, I think, really odd. I mean, he repeated, he, he wrote about it, He's the city editor of the uh, Daily Mail. Nice man. I mean, you know, but, 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 but I, on this, I just think he's a bit weird. He, he, he wrote a piece at the time saying that somehow I caused the, the, the run because I seemed a bit nervous. Um, and, and he repeated that, and then he interviewed me on Newsnight the other day, and, and, and um, he said it again. I, he said, I believe that, you know, Robert Peston caused the run because he seemed a bit nervous. Now, I actually, I don't think I did look particularly nervous uh, uh, in, in, you know, uh, the multiple broadcasts I did that evening. Um, uh, what actually happened was that I broke the news. Um, so there were a number of things that I'm afraid I wasn't aware of that meant that Northern Rock was more vulnerable to a run than many other banks. Now, the reason it was vulnerable to a run was, first of all, that it was a bank that was, to a large extent, an internet bank, right? So it had a, something like a hundred branches and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of customers, many of whom never went into a branch. Now, um, a, a typical high street bank has had at the time well over 2,000 branches, okay? This was a bank, I can't remember actually, I've, the numbers are in this book and I've, I used to know these off by heart, but I think it had something like 2 million customers. It had a lot of customers. Um, and it didn't take very. It didn't take a big proportion of those customers to be a bit anxious and turn up at a branch, at a branch for queues to form. Yeah. Now the second thing that uh, was a structural weakness um, was that it didn't have enough server capacity. So inevitably, when I do a broadcast on the BBC about them having problems, people go online to find out what's happened, and the website crashed because too many people were going online. And that made just people very anxious. Uh, you know, they couldn't, you know, if they wanted to transfer their money out, they couldn't because the website had crashed, and also there was no information to be had. See, uh, so, uh, uh, um, so, you know, it was structurally more vulnerable. Now, you know, I was gobsmacked the next day when these runs you know, when these people, these queues formed, it was, you know, literally the last thing I expected. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I did my story, I thought it was a perfectly interesting story. Um, the, 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 the next, I mean, I'll tell you something else, actually, which is just, just for what it's worth. I mean, I, you know, this is, I won't name the individual, but that night, so I'd already put the story out on the, what's now, uh, used to be called the news channel, it's the 24-hour rolling news channel, I'd already put it out, and I'd put it out online and stuff. But, um, 10 o'clock news is obviously the big event at the BBC. So it's one minute before 10 o'clock, uh, and I'm sitting next to Hugh Edwards. We're about to put the story out on the 10 o'clock news. And the editor of the programme comes in and just says, are you sure this is a story? Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, I, so they weren't really in doubt the next day that it was but I was amazed the, I mean I genuinely was sort of you know when somebody rang me up the next morning and said you know there are these queues out there I thought Christ you know and it you know but you know 
so because there were, look, and, and let's be absolutely clear, this was a sort of weird, because, you know, it wasn't just Alex Brummer who said I was, I was inundated with complaints that I had destroyed the bank, it was all my fault, um, you know, I had a whole autumn, because also, the thing is, I've been banging on about this, these markets closing down for some considerable time, and why this was going to make us all poorer. So I, the entire autumn, I was just got a barrage of abuse from almost, it felt like everybody in the country, saying that I was destroying the British economy, um, single-handed. Um, it was a very, very odd time. The one really important thing here, and it's, a, it's another reason why, to be frank, I don't, you know, I, I genuinely, maybe I should have done, but I literally never lost sleep about, you know, any of this and how I behaved. Right, the, the retail customers, all right, it was a horrible image for the UK. We hadn't had a bank run in this country for 141 years. It didn't, didn't make the UK look good, let's be clear, right? Um, and so obviously, you know, you know, I don't take any pride at all in what actually happened in terms of the bank run and those queues. But we should be under no illusion that it was not those depositors that did for the bank. What did for the bank were the other banks and institutions who had already withdrawn money. The, the run started before my broadcast, right? The reason they went to the Bank of England for cap in hand was because the clever people who were in the know about what was happening at Northern Rock had taken their money out. It's another reason why I have never had a moment's doubt that the British people had a right to know what was going on because, you know, it is, it is the opposite of what a democracy should be about, that the people who happen to be in the city know about the risks and the rest, and the ordinary customers didn't know. So obviously it was in the interests of the millions of people who saved with Northern Rock to know what was going on. And ultimately they're taking their money out, they took out a few billion, right? The institutions and the other banks took out something like £50 billion from Northern Rock. It was the institutions that killed Northern Rock. It was not the savers. And, it wasn't and, they, and they would have taken their money out whatever I had said that night. They were taking it out already, is the point. I actually uh, noted the numbers in your book. Over, just over that weekend, by the close of play on Monday, 4.6 billion had been withdrawn by uh, retail savers, but 25 billion over that period was withdrawn by the markets, by the wholesale yeah. lenders. So, as you say, it was actually the withdrawal of the wholesale finance that, that did for it. That killed it. So, um, actually, I'd like to ask you a question about the role of the media in general off the back of that, because... Yeah. Um, as, we, as we've already explored, you were um, uh, at one point you know, a banking specialist, so you'd got your head, which was considered, I think you said in your book, a sort of bit of a, um, you know, an uninteresting area, right? Yeah. A backwater in, in terms of journalism. And in fact, the same was, tr was true of academia, where people had just stopped bothering studying banks because they thought. I mean, it was economists had no interest in banking in the city at all. It was one of the reasons so, so many of their folk. I mean, you know, it was one of those weird things. My, my dad, who was died this, uh, this year, no, a year ago, excuse me. Um, uh, was an economist, and he always just said, you know, if you've got a choice between a model that tells you one thing and common sense, go with your common sense. Um, and uh, you know, I don't think of myself, I mean, I take an interest in e economics, but I don't think of myself as an economist. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and it was a very interesting period this autumn because common sense, because I knew how the city worked, I knew how banks worked, I knew that when banks can't raise money, they can't lend, and when they can't lend, the economy slows down. And that's what I said all through the autumn. And I said, you know, this is going to be difficult. We are heading for a recession. It's bad, right? But I wasn't doing this on the basis of a model. I was doing this just on the basis of having observed the city for a long time, and I knew how the economy worked, and it's effectively what my dad would call common sense. But it, and it wasn't just politicians and, you know, uh, business people who were attacking me all through the autumn. It was economists, because all the economist models said that the economy was continuing to grow at a perfectly healthy pace, um, and that therefore I was just wrong. Um, but the problem with these models is these models did have no element in them that captured the way that the city provides finance to banks and then how banks lend. And therefore, they just simply weren't capturing in their models the information that at that moment was driving the economy. They just took for granted that the city did its job and they had no way of understanding that when the city doesn't do its job, their models become completely irrelevant. Actually, that's, that's, a, that's a great point at which I wanted to um, wind out the conversation from Northern Rock specifically in mm. finance, because in your book you locate the, the troubles of the financial sector within broader 
economic imbalances and problems that have been building up for many years. Mm. Um, but just to, as a sort of segue into that, um, on the subject of economists, I was very struck by what you wrote, bearing in mind this is five years ago. As a society, we may have become too respectful of experts and certainly too in awe of the claims to scientific certainty of economists. Now, it seems that this is... Uh, uh, so in fact, we've got a whole programme here at the RSA called the Citizens Economic Council, which is, which is precisely sort of trying to put the balance between experts and citizens uh, back into, into kilter. Um, but do you think that um, we have repaired... Uh, the economics profession, do you think, since, since 2007? Do you think we're in a better place now in terms of the ability to get beyond... You know, oh, the model says it's fine, so, so we're not going to question anything. Is, is there a greater questioning attitude, do you think, to looking at our economic problems or problems in the finance sector, or have we not moved on that much? Um, so I thought you were going to, uh, you know, point out my extraordinary and slightly unusual kinship with Michael Gove on this issue. But um, <laughs> um, so, um, what, what, so what do I think? So I... Um, think that financial institutions' reliance on a particular type of model fortunately has been reduced. So one of the things that all these banks got wrong was the way that they measured risk uh, and then m made their loans and, 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 and investments on the basis of what a model was telling them that was likely uh, to happen. And, uh, you know, they were models that were wrong for a couple of reasons. One was they simply didn't believe that serious, you know, because the models only had data that went back during a relatively benign period for the economy and for markets, none of these models captured the possibility of a cataclysmic, you know, 1930s or, you know, 2007-style crisis. Um, and so these models simply were incapable of ever telling them about when, you know, uh, the big, terrible thing might happen. So they, they, you know, those models have mostly been either junked or reworked in a sensible way. But in general, however, I still think that... There's, a, there's too much spurious certainty um, attributed to forecasting claims by economists. I mean, one of the things, you know, I've, I've just finished a new book, which sadly I can't sell to you today because it's not out till November the 2nd, which has the um, jolly title of WTF. Um, <laughs> and um, you might be able to work out what it's about. Um, and one of the things I, I, you know, I, I look at, for example, is the impact on, you know, the credibility of uh, the Treasury, for example, um, of those claims it made during the EU referendum that if we voted to leave, the economy would literally just collapse the next day. Um, and... Um, and you know, I do think that was a silly and rather damaging thing for the Treasury to say. Uh, 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 and um, it's not that... I mean, my own view is there, there is already and will continue to be quite a big economic price to pay for leaving the EU. I said that during the campaign and I continue to say it. Um, but the notion that people... We are an economy that is driven by household spending. Uh, we have, it's one of the problems of the British economy. We are far too dependent on consumption, on all of us spending. And the notion that the very people who voted for Brexit were immediately going to stop spending as a result of their own decision was ridiculous. Um, and, you know, there was, there was, in a sense, therefore, this internal contradiction in the Treasury's forecast. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I remember, you know, if they'd simply put out some documents that said, you know, these are the long-term risks and you've just got to think about them, you know, uh, you know, as an economy, we'll probably manage our way through, but 
um, that would have been fine. Um, but to say, you know, it's going to be Armageddon the day I, was nuts. And it's actually, you know, and, and, and actually brings not only them into disrepute, but again, it's another, it's another blow to the reputation of, of you know, people who on the whole I respect, because um, I'm the son of one, which are economists. Um, so, no, I think there's still a bit of a crisis of, of credibility here. Um, and, and I suppose also you, you, um, you point out that, uh, uh, so you've just mentioned it there, actually, what you consider to be a flaw of the UK economic model, which is that we uh, persistently fail to sell as much to the rest of the world as we buy from them. So we have persistent trade deficits. That means we have to finance those. So you have this irony that we, uh, we essentially buy iPads uh, with borrowed money that we borrowed from the workers in China who actually made the iPads. So um, this cannot surely persist uh, for very long. Now, do you think, do you see any progress in us? Uh, because the coalition government, when they came in, had this big thing about rebalancing the economy, rebalancing it regionally, investment-led growth. Has any of that happened? Have we made any progress at all, do you think, in, in fixing those flaws that you identify? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and, and actually, so, look, I mean, it's, I, I, quite often, in some ways, I hate doing... Uh, these sorts of sessions because, you know, I end up feeling gloomier, you all end up feeling <laughs> gloomier. It's, you know, nothing really changes. Um, uh, so, um, a big, um, you know, a big cause, underlying cause, and, and, and you all know the difference between causes and triggers. Um, so, the trigger of the financial crisis was the closing down of these markets on August the 9th. The underlying causes were the extent to which the rich West became more and more indebted over a period of many years because, you know, we were making much less and selling much less to the rest of the, to the, rest of the world than we were consuming. And inevitably, when you consume more than you earn, your debt goes up. Yeah, all makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and equally, we were hiding a lot of the, the indebtedness that we were accumulating through these complicated financial instruments. Um, and, you know, uh, the, uh, and so it was this combination of financial engineering and rising indebtedness that were the underlying causes of the crisis. Now, there is still quite a lot of complicated financial engineering going on. There is still quite a lot of disguising of risk, but it's not as bad as it was. You know, governments and regulators have got their act together a bit in that sense. But the indebtedness of this country, uh, believe it or don't, is higher than it was at, in 2008 when that proverbial smelly stuff hit the fan. Uh, it is, and the reason, I mean, you'll know why this is, it's because although households have reduced their debts a bit, although household indebtedness is still very high by historical standards, uh, you know, the, the recession led to a collapse in tax revenues, um, which meant, that, which forced the government into big deficits, which means it borrowed a lot more. Similarly, there were quite a big cost of just simply bailing out the banks. You know, when you put all of that together, the indebtedness of the government has gone up massively more than the indebtedness of the private sector has fallen. So in the round, the indebtedness of the economy has gone up. And we still have a model, which is to get back to Tony's important point, where effectively our growth is still generated by the manufacture of debt. Um, and, you know, interest rates are have been since the crash as close to zero as you can get there are arguments between economists about you know how long you can have negative interest rates for but the truth is that there does come a moment where the burden even when you have historic you know interest rates you know uh, uh, in the uk at the moment are lower than they've been at any time since the creation of the bank of england in the late 17th century i mean that's the sort of nature of the hist that's the sort of historic nature of where we are right now um, and there just comes a moment when you know debt, you know the indebtedness gets to a level where the world recognizes that you simply can't repay all that debt. Um, and, and then you get into, you know, this is where we all get very, very gloomy. And then you get into a sort of crisis that makes what happened in 2008, you know, look like 
um, you know, a, a, a picnic, as it were. Um, now, and you know, and, and reality is the, the way that Western economies run. You know, we haven't we haven't averted that problem yet. You know, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not going to say it's happening next year. But unless we change the model in the West of how we drive growth, at some point, a country it might might not be us. I mean, the most the, the, always the favoured candidate for this would be Japan. You know, because Japan actually has government debt that is, it depends how you measure it, probably two and a half times the size of our debt and it's been living with anyway th th nobody really believes that japan can ever repay this debt but 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 we're living through this sort of global pretense that maybe one so it, it it hasn't been um the kind of crisis that it will one day be and, and the problem with these anyway we won't stay on this at some point this will be you know um, there are enough problems in the world of, of, of other sorts to worry but this this will be quite a big problem at some point well we, we... <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I, I, I want to stick with the gloom a little bit longer before we open up to the audience uh, for Q&A. Maybe, maybe somebody out there can uplift us. But I, just, I want to talk a little bit about the political consequences of all of this, which yeah. you do also sort of uh, go into. And yeah. um, when we talk about the economic malaise, you, you make some observations in your, in your book about the unequal impact of that economic malaise. And I, I was interested to pick out that you quoted the ratio of CEO pay to... Um, mm to workers, which now, of course, is, is a government proposal that firms should have to publish and justify that ratio. But you point out that after 10 years of um, Thatcherism, it was 20 to 1. So CEOs were paid just 20 times uh, shop floor workers. When you wrote Who Runs Britain, it was 75 to 1. And when, when you wrote How Do We Fix This Mess, it had gone up to 184 to one. Now, I wonder if you've revisited that statistic in your latest book, and you know what it is. But it's it, I think three, it's, it's about 300 to one. Now, it's about it? 300 to one, which is extraordinary. Um, and it's, and I, I'm going to pick out another quote now, if I, I may, because um, I thought it's, uh, it seemed rather uh, prescient, really, which um, was, history would suggest that in a time of economic dislocation, where the interests of haves and have-nots can diverge for an extended period, a sharper delineation between left and right will emerge, and a greater opportunity for electoral success may be presented to minor and fringe parties. So you, so you said in 2012. Um, now, I mean, would, would, is that how you... occasionally get uh, things right. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a relief. Um, but, but I just want to test to what extent... So there's a sort of narrative that says, actually, you can explain Trump, Brexit, all, anything that you don't like almost, I suppose. Uh, and you can trace its roots to the financial crisis. Is it really... It, Really? No, no, I don't. I, so, I, I think that. Uh, so, I think some of. Um, so, so the new book is. Um, as I say, it's called WTF, and it's about why in the rich West um, voters are not behaving the way that the establishment has expected them to behave. It's 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 you know it's why they've turned on the establishment and why they've chosen Trump, why they voted for Brexit, why we had the Corbyn surge, why they went for Macron in France. And there are lots of other manifestations of voters simply saying, we've had enough of the lot who've been running this place for the last 30 years. And that's what the book is about, trying to explain that. And some of it is a direct consequence of, you know, those events that began in 2007, the financial crisis, because some of that... Uh, rejection of the establishment is because living standards for millions and millions and millions and millions of people um, are lower than they were in 2007 and if they are higher for millions of people they're only a tiny bit higher um, you know the path uh, of the economies particularly our economy uh, since the recession has been significantly weaker in respect of growth than out of previous recessions so you know we are a lot poorer today all of us than we expected to be, and many people are, in absolute terms, poorer than they were. Inevitably, you know, they feel angry. But it's not just that. I mean, you know, there are there are lots of other things going on um, in places like America and Britain and France. It's also the incredible regional, um, the, the incredible difference in patterns of. Uh, growth uh, and in prosperity between different parts of the country. So, you know, we live here in London in a part of the country that has done 
consistently well over many years and continues to do pretty well. Um, there are obviously issues for young people about being able to afford to live in London. I'm not saying London without, is without its problems, but living standards here are, you know, so much higher than they are in the North East uh, or, and in parts of the Midlands and, 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 and you know, uh, and, and in many other parts of the UK. So there are these regional inequalities and you can see those regional inequalities um, in the States as well. And typically, the people who voted for Trump or voted for Brexit were often particularly white working class people um, whose economic performance has been pretty awful over the next few, the, the last few years. And they feel angry. Some of that is the financial crisis, but some of that predates the financial crisis. And it's to do with other things. It's to do with things like the neglect of manufacturing. It's to do, you know, with this sort of myth that somehow if you simply had a pockets of excellence like the city, it would lift up all boats. Turned out to be bollocks. Again, to use another technical term. Um, the, uh, and, and we also were naive. I mean, people like me were fantastically naive about trends that were palpably in the interest of the world as a whole. Um, you know, people like me, and I was broadly for quite a long time a cheerleader for Globalization, because it was you know some, I, one of the, you know I'd be immersing myself for years in what was happening in China, um, and you know when you've seen over many years hundreds of millions of Chinese people being lifted out of poverty by these global trends, it's impossible not to think this is an incredibly powerful and good thing for the world. The problem is that if you happen to be a not very well-off person in the Northeast. And over an extended period, and the statistics show that this is absolutely true, that while um, you know, the Chinese have undergone this revolution in which living standards have you know, improved by hundreds and hundreds of percent, but actually your living standards over you know, 15, 20 years in parts of America and parts of the Northeast have basically flatlined, you think, well, globalization is great for the Chinese, but it's done fuck all for me. And, and, th and that doesn't give you a nice warm feeling. Um, and again, we, we were just very naive about, um, you know, how long people who were plainly losers from globalisation would tolerate this. Well, I suppose, that, as I, I'll, I'll come to the audience now, but perhaps in an attempt to, to lift our spirits, I suppose it, it's worth mentioning that over an ex the last year and a half, the RSA, we, we run an extended programme of work on inclusive growth, and this has been championed by the OECD, and it seems to be becoming part of the narrative now to recognise that we must have an economic strategy which will speak as much to people in the North East who are not well off as, as, as everyone else. So uh, let's hope that that continues to take hold. Um, but now it's time for you to ask some questions. So we'll have a group of three questions. Please um, do, uh, before you ask the questions, say who you are. And uh, we've got three of the first. Uh, let's start at the back, if I may. Hello, I'm Rebecca Sadler, Green Party. Do you believe in exponential growth being good? Oh, straight, straight into the jugular there. Um, the gentleman on the... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm really making the people with the mics work. To, um, to all the people at the edges, sorry about that, microphone uh, helpers. And then the, the, um, uh, the gentleman over there, who very strategically is using his copy of a magazine to gain extra height and has caught my attention. Um, oh, hi, it's uh, Paul Pritchard. I should probably start... Oh, Robert may think I need to start with the Mayor Corpa because... I actually was on one of the FSA Basel working groups for a number of years before 2007. So, but leaving, leaving, fault, that, aside, fault, leaving that aside, <laughs> um, the decline in trust in institutions isn't uh, confined to financial services. But if we look at what good organizations do, however you define good, um, I would take people like Unilever and Marks and Spencers, look at how their business actually contributes to the well-being of society, socially, environmentally, so on. Does a long-term strategy start measuring stuff? But I don't see any of that in, in the banking sector. I don't see any of them owning it, um, either as a group collectively, you know, the City UK organising something, or even one trying to differentiate itself by saying, you know, look, we're the one for the future. We're supporting decarbonisation and 
Okay. I wonder what you thought about that. Great. And then the third question was the gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, John Bailey. Um, is it, is it rather surprising that all those organisations that demutualised only five minutes ago have all failed? Was it because of the, uh, the factor you mentioned in terms of risk, or was it that the, 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 the standards by which they were managed was stupendously stupid? Um, so, exponential growth in a world of scarce resources I mean, I would accept that it's not um, uh, optimal, as it were, for the long, long term. The problem is, and um, the, in the absence of growth, we've got to be, as a society, much better at sharing out what we make. Um, you know, and, and uh, because we on the whole, have no history of doing that voluntarily on any great scale. What we're really talking about there is you know, the need to put up taxes, both income and wealth taxes, very significantly. And the British people don't yet seem to be quite there. Um, but that is the choice. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, that, is the, uh, that is the choice that we face, um, which is in a world of slow growth, um, uh, you know, we either have to accept these terrible inequalities between rich and poor, and indeed there are all sorts of reasons to do with technology why those inequalities are almost certainly going to get a lot worse. Um, uh, but even with those widening inequalities, there's not going to be the cake itself is not going to get much bigger, um, uh, you know. And so we've either got to accept a very unfair society, and also probably a society where public services aren't what we expect of them, or we've got to accept that taxes are going to have to go up very significantly. Um, and that's where the debate in this country, frankly, has to go now. Uh, on your, so I'm going to now say something which almost makes me cry, actually, um, because there is one aspect of the Northern Rock crisis that actually makes me feel really awful. Northern Rock took these mad risks as a bank, but it behaved in terms of its community impeccably. Right? It put a certain proportion of its profits into a charitable foundation, which gave away in the northeast, I can't remember in total, I think it's in the end hundreds of millions of pounds, right, to really good causes in the northeast, right? So it behaved in, a, in, in, in terms of its social responsibilities in the way that all companies, in my view, should behave, and none do, right? And so it, there is, as I say, it just, it really breaks my heart that a bank that behaved really badly in terms of, you know, the capitalist rule book, as it were, actually behaved rather well in terms of its social responsibilities and I just wish to God, you know, people would focus on, the, on that good thing that Northern Rock did and replicated it in other instances. And then what was the final? Demutualisation. Oh yeah, I mean look, it was a combination, you know, there were some bad managers within, you know, you, you, you'd essentially take, in many cases, not all, but you took, building societies are uh, relatively easy businesses to manage because they are so they were so restricted in the way that they could raise money and lend money and and therefore quite often there was a problem of quality of management because quite often you took managers who were managing quite a simple business who then got very overexcited encouraged often by bankers in the city of London to take on all sorts of other risks and you know so it was it was a sort of combination of poor quality management the city misbehaving in terms of encouraging in some cases, not very talented managers to, you know, behave in ways that the managers and boards didn't properly understand. And, you know, the, the, I'm afraid, uh, you know, the result was um, sad. Um, I mean, and, and, and all credit to the nationwide, you know, which didn't demutualize, still a bloody good organization. Well, and, and to add a note of positivity, actually, as I was telling Robert earlier on, there, we hosted a meeting this morning um, uh, that, of a fellow-led initiative to set up new regional mutual banks with a uh, social conscience, as it were, that we could perhaps act more like in the way the good part of the Northern Rock and recreate that. So uh, 
there are, I think, signs that we could have new banks emerging that, that, that perhaps are the sort of banks you, you were describing you'd like to see. But let's take some more questions. So, uh, gentleman in the middle, um, the lady over here, pl over pl at the front, and then uh, perhaps we'll have um, the gentleman next to him just to make it a bit easier for the mic to travel around, because we've only got one left. <laughs> Thank you. Um, David Walker, I'm uh, an economist, but now broadly retired. Um, you talked about uh, Northern Rock going bankrupt, but wasn't it really just a liquidity crisis because most of the loans, the long-term loans, have turned out to be very good and formed the basis of, I think, Virgin Bank. And so it must be incredibly unfair and inequitable that the poor old shareholders got wiped out. This was, of course, referred to on the Sunday program of, I think it's um, somebody has, I think you were on, about, and we heard um, a, a plaintiff key, key um, plea from a shareholder who's active saying that you know, they, they really felt very badly treated indeed. So what about the shareholders? And can we get the mic down to the bottom here? Um, sorry, the front row here. Lady on the far left. Uh, just a brief question. Uh, do you agree or disagree with Matt Wrigley that there's too, there's too much regulation of the banks and he thinks there should be even less? I, I should mention that Matt Wrigley was the chair of Northern Rock at the time it collapsed, right? And that was the gentleman two, two over. Just seeking out the, the more positive part of the agenda, in your researches and discussions for your future book, um, what uh, trends or themes have you picked up that might give us sort of more confidence that we can get out of this mess? Great. So. What about the shareholders? What about Matt Ridley? And what are the signs we can get out of the mess? Um, so I always slightly get my hackles up when somebody says it was just a liquidity problem. Um, you know, the, one of the fundamental things that banks have to do is manage their liquidity. I mean, one of the things that they consistently failed, one of the reasons we had the mother of all financial crises was because consistently banks forgot the importance of liquidity, of borrowing from sources that you could rely on, having a, a, a greater proportion of their liabilities in the form of cash, uh, managing the term borrowing you do in a more appropriate way. You know, basically banks behaved as though to use uh, an expression which has become slightly well known in a different context, there was a magic money tree. Um, and, you know, the, again, the history of capitalism proves that when you do behave as though there's a magic money tree, you know, bad things happen. So I don't really buy the argument that it was just a liquidity problem. Northern Rock knew the rules. The rules at that time were that if you went to the Bank of England for emergency liquidity assistance, at that point, by definition, you had failed as an institution, right? That was just what the rules said. You were in the hands of the authorities at that point. Now, obviously, so, and the, so, so two or three other points. If they hadn't been uh, uh, bailed out, they would have been forced into a fire sale of their assets and indeed, you know, they would have been completely insolvent. Right, because they would, you know, the, the assets that they owned would have been sold at a knockdown price. Um, now, as it happens, taxpayers stepped in and bailed them out, and it was the taxpayers' provision of our money put at risk, which gave them the gave the government the space to hold those assets to maturity. And it, you, you may be right that at the end of the day, um, they may end up, you know, the the, the um, government may end up with a profit uh, if all of, those bank, all of those loans are eventually over 20, 30 years repaid or if they manage to sell those, 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 those parcels of loans at book value, which, and it looks as though that is going to happen. But again, remember, it wasn't that long after the crisis that the government, on the way that you assess um, the capital requirements of banks and the value of the portfolio, the government, we taxpayers, had to put some capital into the bank. Not the private sector, we did as taxpayers, we put money into the bank. So my broad view is, although, of course, 
I have an enormous amount of human sympathy with any shareholder who ever loses money in any situation, but particularly in this situation because these shareholders did not understand the risks that their bank were taking, and I think that's sad and awful that they didn't understand. You can, unless we are going to abandon capitalism in total, you cannot have a world in which some share... The, the point about buying shares is you ought to know when you buy shares that there is a risk these shares will go to zero, right? That is the nature of buying shares. And I don't think there is anything in this case, I'm afraid to say, which persuades me that this lot should be bailed out when lots of other shareholders have lost a ton of money in other circumstances. And it's awful and it's sad. Um, uh, but I, you know, I just think if we want to have a capitalist you know, PLC-based system of the sort we have, then these sort of rather awful things periodically have to happen. In, in terms of regulation, so my view would be that, curiously, if we had um, simpler banks, but also we had a cultural shift whereby people like us thought that it would be acceptable to lend money to a bank, but if the bank did a stupid thing, the money we deposited, our savings, would not be protected 100%. Uh, you know, if we were prepared to suffer the fate of those poor Northern Rock shareholders, not with money invested in shares, but with our savings, then you could, of course, have simpler regulation. Um, because, you know, in those circumstances, you could treat banks like any other kind of institution, and you would allow them to compete, and if one failed, you simply wound it up, and, you know, the, the, the poor savers would you know, only get whatever the assets would uh, realise. But actually, as a society, it's perfectly clear that we don't believe it's proper for savers to be able to lose money, and therefore regulation, if anything, is, you know, it's certainly, there, is, there certainly isn't too much regulation, and there are some reasons for saying that we still haven't restructured the banking system in a way that is adequate to provide sufficient security, and you know, I find it very difficult to believe there's too little regulation. And then there was finally a question was whether I could say anything um, uplifting. Um, well, so, I mean, I, don't, look, I mean, it's two things. One is, I'm not really here to talk about the book, and there is quite a lot of, in the book about the kind of policies that we need and the kind of choices we need to make um, to get us through what is a very difficult um, period. Um, uh, I mean, partly, I don't want to talk about it now uh, because the book's not out till November the 2nd, and uh, partly um, just because it's quite a long conversation. But the main point is I'm not actually, I mean, you know, I know people think of me as being terribly gloomy. I'm actually not fundamentally a gloomy or pessimistic person because when I look around at a country like ours, what I basically see is both a pretty rich country um, and a country filled with thoroughly decent people who ultimately end up making the right kind of decisions, even if we manage to make some fucking stupid decisions along the way. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'm sort of broadly confident that we'll get to the right place, but probably not in as sufficient a way as we might, you know. You know I, I think that's probably a good place <laughs> to leave it, actually. And, and, we, and we have run out of time. I mean, there, we could ask uh, questions for the rest of the day, but we can't do that because we finish at 2 o'clock on the dot. Robert is able to stay with us to sign books out in the lobby, if you'd like to, although don't... I a new one, but it's still apparently a brilliant book, it turns out. Uh, by I this one, no, no, it, it, uh, no I, must have, I, I had initial scepticism about the effusiveness of Giles Corrin's uh, cover note, saying, brilliant, now I understand everything. But colleagues have been saying, how's the book? And I said, well, actually, it's brilliant, and now I do understand everything. So I would consider purchasing it. Please don't purchase it on reckless consumer debt, however, <laughs> only from your savings. So um, it only remains to say... Uh, Thanks ever so much to you for joining us, to those who are, who are watching us online, and of course to Robert Peston. Please give us a